build the glass printer. We wanted to do some of this by work that we did in product disk scale in the architectural scale. So this is the video of the first printer. The second printer is online now. Um, I like this video um, because it shows the very, very beginning of the, of the technology that we've developed. So this was the first nozzle, four millimeters, quite uh, big. Um, and over time, we're getting better and better. There's a parametric software environment that is attached to the printer that can uh, link uh, and tell us exactly how much time, what kind of temperature gradients do we need to control in order to produce what kind of shapes. Thank you for the DJs, awesome. So 1900 Fahrenheit, um, and this first printer, which was much more primitive than the one we have now, was connected to a, uh, a 3D printer at ca cartridge kiln. Uh, we pour in the molten glass. Uh, we let it um, gra be gravity fed into the kiln cartridge, uh, and then we then observe uh, through a window in the printer. patterns, much like honey on toast. And so by controlling the temperature variation, the temperature gradients, and the height, we could also control the shape of these uh, meandering autocoiled forms. because you can control the interior and the exterior features independently. In effect, you are designing and printing an optical lens in product scale. And that is very, very exciting uh, because if we can print optical lenses in product scale and in, even in architectural scales, uh, we can potentially harness and harvest solar energy. And so the current work that we're doing with the printer now, we can print up to three meters, a three meter column. And we're looking at the possibility or opportunities to create inner channels and inner pockets, much like you've seen in the death masks, the life masks. Uh, and the earlier works from Shtari, the wearable digestive system, but this time in actual architectural scale in order to harness solar energy. And think of the possibility of replacing 450 billion metric a billion uh, square feet uh, per annum in the United States alone, alone um, to harness uh, uh, light and, and, and heat. Uh, I want to end um, by talking a little bit about communication uh, and, um, and the ability uh, here in, in terms of communication we're asking what does it mean when we have more than a single printer and can we print or manufacture products and buildings that are larger than the size of the Gantt or the size of the printer itself. What is Twitter, uh, what is the uh, printer answer to Twitter in the age of biodigital fabrication? And so we've developed um, most recently, and this is a project that is still, still under development, a fiber bots. And these are robots that are designed with a vertically winding system uh, that is programmed to wind fiber as they climb on top of their own fabrication output. So we can design uh, geometries with uh, different types of fibers. Fibers, combinations obviously of fibers and matrix. Um, and the robot is programmed to vary the distribution of those fibers as a function of the structural load. Um, these are the various parts that we've designed um, and simulated uh, the structures that we wanted to design with them. So we call them fiber bots for now. And those fiber bots are much like uh, mini 3D printers. This is the actual structure that we built. 
um, a few weeks ago. So these are about five or six meter tall towers. And the robots are programmed to work collaboratively uh, to avoid collision, to speak to each other as they climb on top of their fabrication output. Hopefully uh, those could be uh, better coordinated to create uh, towers uh, in the future. And going even bigger in scale, uh, this is the largest print we've done. This is in Mountain View, California, uh, not far away from here in one of the Google S X hangars. Um, this is a robotic arm uh, that is a compound fabrication system, a hydraulic arm with five degrees of freedom connected to an electric arm with six degrees of freedom. And they are programmed much like an arm and a hand or a shoulder and the arm. Um, to compensate each other's movements. So the hydraulic arm is basically a cherry picker that's designed for grass manipulation, and the smaller arm, the baby kuka at the very, very edge, uh, is designed for oscillation control. Um, 80, diameter, uh, 80 feet diameter reach, pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Um, this is it being uh, almost designed almost like a self-driving -drive car, not there yet, but close to being self-driven. Um, leaves the hangar, goes out to the site, um, and drives around. So here the idea is that the gantry moves around. It's a gantry less uh, large uh, scale 3D printer. Um, this was printed uh, this 13.5 hours over two days. Um, and this is sort of a half a dome, just as a proof of concept using foam in this case. Uh, with obviously the anticipation of using concrete and uh, moon regolith uh, and exploring, of course, construction for extreme environments. Obviously for Mars, uh, there's a lot of interest from NASA for uh, obvious reasons. Uh, one of my PhD students are uh, remote controlling uh, the, the truck, uh, the printer goes back to the hangar. Uh, there's a drone that shows Steve in the center sort of just waving at us uh, to show completely gantryless a self-driven large-scale compound fabrication system. What does it mean to combine the fire bots, the communication between bots, this larger scale manufacturing system? And how do we move to an age where, uh, where these robots can communicate just as well as termites? Um, this is, uh, I just wanted to end with uh, this last slide. This is an old work of ours, the Silk Pavilion, uh, where we use 6,500 silkworms uh, to produce a three meter diameter dome over three weeks. Um, and those were, uh, the, the, the notion or the idea behind this project uh, was to design a bucky dome that's made of a single part, a single uh, silk fiber. Um, we are revisiting the project uh, for a major uh, museum commission and here we're asking, can